Alright, yes, so we're going back to a series that I thought I had finished a few months ago, um, because there actually is one that I ended up overlooking, because it was in a place that I wasn't really looking, I guess. Um, I remember seeing advertisements for them doing, like, a creep show series of sorts, but with the way a lot of that stuff kind of goes, sort of like that uh, Scream TV series they did or stuff like that, I just never really gravitate towards the idea of when horror movies kind of become uh, TV series, at least lately. Um, so I just kind of was dismissive of its whole existence. Like, not really, like, not assuming it was just going to be shit, but just I really had no interest. Um, even despite the concept uh, and the whole horror anthology thing being I love and the first Creep Show movie being something that I absolutely love. Um, but I just kind of didn't really care about its existence, so I just kind of went past it. And then recently learned that the very first episode, the well, the first half of the very first episode, was an adaptation of Grey Matter from Night Shift. Uh, and since we talked about the Nightmares and Dreams miniseries and uh, a couple of the episodes from the Tales from the Dark Side series, um, I figured this counts. So, <laughs> so uh, I figured we would go ahead and uh, go back and see what that looked like, and uh, yeah, so we'll just go into that uh, as we talk about the story as we did with all the others in the short story series I was doing over the summer. Um, so as far as this goes, um, it is as, the intro is pretty much exactly what you would expect it to be, like the sort of comic-like intro that we saw in the in between. At the, st at the start and in between in the both movies of Creepshow uh, that I saw. <laughs> so, um, and uh, during these opening credits, we see that this episode is directed by Greg Nicotero, which is a very uh, promising start. Obviously, he is the legendary uh, effects and makeup artist. And there was definitely, that's definitely the kind of uh, person you want directing something a story like this in the direction that it goes. So, because this is a case where this uh, story could be very hard to... Ex I, when I read it, uh, Grey Matter, it was like, I, I felt like this would be really hard to adapt to screen. Uh, and I wonder if anybody would ever try. Uh, and it's surprisingly works well, but like I said, to have somebody like him not only working on it, but specifically directing the episode, uh, probably had a lot to do with how good the execution ended up turning out. But as far as our characters go, you'll notice when you read the story that the characters are not really a strength of it at all. Um, if, it, if anything, the characters are like super, super vague, almost seemingly on purpose, because it's like the stories that they tell are what's what makes everything so ominous and what kind of makes the so it's not really the characters individually that are standing out but some of the things they have to say uh, are kind of what shape the feel of this whole thing so they, they've even, it's gotten to the point to where we've cut down the number of characters and their names have been changed and ba basically they're new characters entirely um, where the proprietor now is Adrian Barbeau who obviously we saw in the crate in the original movie um, playing this very well and being like this welcome presence that kind of gives it this sort of classic feel um and her other classics like uh the fog and stuff like that but um with her we have giancarlo esposito and tobin bell so it's like holy shit they got a pretty stellar cast for this first portion of this episode um so that in itself uh, helped a lot in regards to... Because that, that's the thing, is when you read the story and you're like, well, the characters aren't very strong, so how is that going to adapt well? And it's like, by changing the characters entirely and bringing in these three actors that we know very well and have brought so much to other projects, makes perfect sense. And it's like, okay, now we've probably got something in at least the character department for what little we need it for. Because um, every now and then, like I said, really the only thing that brought the characters to life before were... Um, some of the sort of setting up the tone kind of stories they had, like the, um, there's a few references to, uh, outside of other King's works, like, uh, it's, it's my understanding that the whole story is kind of set in, like, the same area that Dreamcatcher is, but then there's a segment, like, a, almost a whole page is devoted to it in a, this very short story that's only, like, ten pages long, um, of our narrator, whoever he is, 
uh, knowing a guy named George Kelso, and just very sort of nonchalantly, with seemingly no connection to anything whatsoever, um, he, uh, no connection to another story whatsoever, um, he tells the story of a guy, this guy, George Kelso, that went down into a sewer pipe, and when he came back out, he had white hair, and his eyes looked like he had looked through a window to hell, I believe is how it's described. Um, and that sounds a lot like another story, and then there's also little not-so-hidden references, like the, the very first time we see Tobin Bell in the episode, he's got, um, like, missing pet posters behind him, and there's like, two for Winston Churchill from Pet Cemetery, and there's a St. Bernard that's labeled Cujo. Um, so I guess, I, I don't know if they, like, it, it, a lot of people like to call them Easter eggs. Um, Easter eggs are, are usually hidden, uh, so I don't know that that's the word I would use, <laughs> the phrase I would use. Um, but, it, it, but it is nice to always see those sort of in-universe uh, references around just to sort of set the whole uh, king feel, I guess, and kind of show that it's like a such a loving portrayal of his work in general. Uh, so, when you uh, see w where exactly this is going, I do like that, um, I like the setup in the episode probably uh, more so than the story because we have the whole thing where it's simultane. we're getting the story simultaneously as they're going out to deliver beer to Richie, who is potentially morphing into something monstrous and totally inhuman, uh, starting with drinking this beer that seems to be forming some sort of mold. Um, it's like, I, this is another one of those King stories where I just love the simplicity of it. I mean, there's a lot of allegories you could take away from it, even in just the small uh, ten pages, but there's a lot more you can grasp from it uh, by the way that it's translated into this episode. Um, because you can throw, and because obviously you've, got, if if you even want, this is the kind of story where you can absolutely just admire its simplicity, or you could go into what all the different meanings or allegories this stuff could possibly be. The thing, obviously, it's most obvious would be like alcoholism and children dealing with parents that have alcoholism. The fact that children are usually the ones that have to pay the price or end up helping them out more than they help their child out. Um, when they're dealing with alcoholism, and obviously that's taken in a very dark, sort of little shop of horrors direction <laughs> by the end of this story. Um, but, uh, yeah, but on top of that, though, if you just want to look at it from a sort of the bare-bones perspective, um, it does make a very interesting monster story, especially with the way it's... because in the story, if I remember correctly, the story is being relayed to them as they um, walk to the apartment. But the thing here is, you're getting the story relayed to us once in the episode, while Jane Carlos Macedo and Tobin Bell are going and delivering the beer. But unlike the story, the, when they're going to the apartment, they don't know what's there or what exactly to expect, at least in detail. Um, so they're just walking right into it, thinking this might be just a casual thing, and it's... M m there's obviously some sort of turmoil here, um, but probably not near to the degree that they are expecting. So to kind of have that anticipation through the whole episode, um, as we get more and more of the story, as they get closer and closer to the apartment. Um, and it's, <laughs> and that whole thing, and the way it sort of, by the time it gets to the end, the way it's just like a full-on case of, like, escalation, um, is really, uh, in, in that, like, 20 to 25 minutes or so, there's, like, so much suspense and build-up that works really well. Um, now, as far as execution goes in regards to, uh, what he looks like as he's turning into whatever this is, um... It was a case where this was going to be... Because I was concerned because the as, as great as King can set a scene, this was just the ma way my mind was working, I guess. But when I was when I was seeing it described in the story of what he was morphing into and what it looked like, the thing I kept seeing was that episode of SpongeBob where Squidward is accidentally encased in cement and leaves and they name him Smelly. Uh, that's what I kept <laughs> picturing, and it's like, how can you possibly make that threatening? Um, but then when you see what's going on here, um, they're able to use these masterful effects. The effects are really good in these, uh, 
earlier portions of it when he's like in the still it's hard to say early stages of this because it's such a it, it, it escalates very quickly but um it's like equally gross and scary like usually you have to choose a lot of the time if you're dealing with less talented people where it's like do you want to focus on the gross aspect or do you want to focus on the scary aspect and luckily this is another one of those stories that knows how to do both um so when we see him and he's got his kid's blanket draped over him timmy's blanket draped over him uh and he's like cloaked and that in itself is just this really creepy looking image and the way that they don't like show us the reveal when he takes it off right away um there is if there's one thing i think could have come through a little better in the episode um that's so good about the story is when they describe what it sounds like when he talks um and like just how inhuman it sounds um but um but it's still the imagery still absolutely and totally works um and then just the way that like it's i mean it is a case of it's it would be kind of hard to have a climax for this episode if we did it the way that um the story did which was to not show too much or what we do see what is described to us and what the narrator sees is described very briefly because he basically sees it and then takes off running um, but of course, you know, being this episode and the way the story is and how we have to have a climax of sorts, we're going to get, you know, a good look at it. And the fact that it's, uh, splits apart and it's starting to multiply is something that it's almost like the, almost like the narrator, he, cause he ran away so quickly. It's like, I'm pretty sure that's what was happening, but I'm not 100%, but I am thinking the worst, um, is kind of how it goes. And there's like that uncertainty. Um, so there's, and, uh, and uh, the way they deal with that sort of ambiguous nature reminds me a lot, uh, when, when you look at the ending of the story versus the ending of the episode, it reminds me a lot of, uh, the adaptation of The Mist, um, which would have been the last, uh, movie I talked about in, when I was doing this particular short story series thing. Um, but it's, uh, the way they kind of leave it up in the story is like a, it's half total and complete you know, apocalyptic terror, and the other half is maybe there's possible hope. Um, when we know that the the character Henry in the story ha is shooting at it, and after the narrator has already run away, and there's that question of, did that work or not? Um, and the story just ends with them waiting to see if either there's there's a it's, it feels 50 50 there's a chance that henry killed it there's a chance that it's multiplying gonna take over the world uh, <laughs> there's no there's no third option um and of course um much like the mist we get more of a definitive uh answer and ending in the adaptation so here uh it's just pretty straightforward yeah they're multiplying and they're gonna take over the world um but I do think there is a case where a lot of obviously a lot of people, including King, preferred the ending of the movie uh, for the Mist uh, rather than the ambiguous one that King went for, which was pretty much the same thing of we're just sitting and waiting is how it ends. Um, but I think the ending of Grey Matter in the story does work, but like the ambiguous ending works a lot better, where you kind of have that equal parts hope and equal parts like equal parts optimism, and equal part pessimism. Uh, and that's, I don't know, for some reason, it's interesting how it's open-ended, yet somehow it still felt satisfying. Um, even for a story that's only like ten pages long. So, but I don't, I don't hate the ending of the episode or anything, um, but it's just, it felt like there was a lot more to the, uh, I feel like there was a lot more to take away from the more ambiguous ending. Uh, and sort of the way it's, what exactly it brought out of you, like in, in a, kind of an emotional sense. Um, like I said, it's either, because when you see it as it's either optimistic or pessimistic, both of those, whichever one you go for, are equally strong. Because, like, if you're going to hope that Henry killed it, you're really, really hoping. You're really hoping Henry killed it. But if you're on the pessimistic side, it's about as bleak as it could possibly get. You're going either to one extreme or the other, and I really like that it was able to accomplish that. Um, rather than just giving us definitive one and say, because it's so easy to say like, oh, you know, it's total and complete chaos from now on. 
um, they're going to take over the world very, very, very soon. This will not take long at all at the rate they're going to be multiplying. The end. Um, it almost feels too easy. Um, so the king is kind of able to get two simultaneous yet opposite reactions out of his ending um, is is the one I, I prefer. But um, Something that the episode does do that I don't think the story does enough... Um, well, not so much that, but... Um, what the episode was able to add, um, because I don't want to go after a, you know, ten-page short story for not doing enough, because it's, the whole point is to be condensed, um, and it, ca and it, um, it captures what it needs to in that ten pages, but the idea of expanding on that, and being able to bring in a more emotional atmosphere in regards to, um, Timmy and Richie's relationship, where we have this whole set up where they're obviously dealing with the loss of the wife slash mother and uh, and there's obvious in the story he always seems kind of distant and potentially aggressive um and in the um episode we do get more of a uh, you, you get very much the allegory of like because obviously not just allegory the whole alcoholism thing is there quite literally um for like half of it but then as it gets into the whole you know, gray matter, you know, monster process of it. Um, it kind of it kind of takes that theme and carries it to another level. Um, but you can still kind of see it there and take it as that. Um, but they actually have some really brief emotional moments here, where he's talking about you know his desperation to quit and stuff like that. And that's the whole thing where it's uh, when we do get to the ending, because that, because that's the thing is when you set up these this sort of emotional foundation, like, the more invested you are in it emotionally, the more visceral the scares are going to be when they come. So when we get to the end, and we obviously are, we're getting to that quick escalation, and the uh, Timmy telling Adrian Barbo the story versus Giancarlo Esposito coming, you know, face-to-face -face with it, uh, both at the same time, and it's cutting back and forth, um... It's like, and you see, like, Esposito's revulsion, just absolute and total and complete revulsion at what he's looking at. And Barbo's got that face that brings back, like, the the feel of, like, the classic terror stuff that she initially comes from. Like, that era that she comes from. It's like she brought it with her in this look as she's getting the rest of the final parts of the story. Um, and we get kind of an emotional payoff here. Because we do have these good scenes between father and son with uh, Jesse Boyd playing Richie and Christopher Nathan doing uh, Timmy. And there's something, there's something here. So when we get to the end and it's like, why were you helping him? Like, why were you feeding him like Seymour feeds Audrey too? Um, and his response was because he promised he'd quit. And it's like, that's sort of this whole thing of having, like, a parent that has this addiction or alcoholism or whatever and telling, giving their child empty promises will warp, possibly warp the way the child sees the whole thing in general, the whole addiction or whatever. Um, and so, and the fact that that led him to those, those sort of unintentionally or not empty promises um, brought about this whole catastrophe, uh, to put it mildly, so, um, there's definitely something in there that's, uh, as, as I said many times before, when you're looking at King, there's, like, so many different ways you can sort of, uh, take what's here, and, or if you just want to take it at the face value of just strictly a horror story, um, they work just as well, but I always like, uh, how you can find, like, those sort of deeper meanings in most of King's stuff. Uh, so, and this, and this is one of those also, like I said, in such a condensed time and such a seemingly simple story, um, there's definitely something worthwhile in here, so that's pretty much what I take away from that. Um, and as, as, as far as the show, I don't know that I would, I mean, if, the, if they, um, adapt another King story, I might look into it, but it won't be a show that I, like, um, seek out the other episodes too or anything. I, d I didn't even watch the second half of this episode. I just watched <laughs> just Grey Matter by itself. Um, but I might, if, if there's like nothing else and it's available, I might give it a chance just to see. Um, but yeah, I just don't really have too much interest in it outside of King's involvement. So uh, that's where I land with that. So 
Uh, yeah, so this should be the end of this, uh, unless at some point soon we're getting another adaptation. I know, um, some things, like, I know, like, I think the Boogeyman has had something in, like, like, it's been announced, like, a couple of times, but I don't know exactly if they're going any farther with that, um, or any of the others here, but, um, we'll look out for those when they come. And I will be continuing the novella series also. We're still on Full Dark No Stars, um, so we'll be getting to that, and there's much more Varsa stuff, a few, a few of which are more King adaptations. Uh, after having just talked about Christine, we've got like three or four more or something. There's, there's a lot of King everywhere, but like I said, his stories are so just vast and different. Um, it's like you can hardly tell that uh, they're from the same place unless you're like really you know, just a fan as in general, but, um, that's, that's pretty much, uh, where I can leave this, so until all of that other stuff, as we're going into the second part of the month, uh, I think that's it for this.